Guru Nation, how's it going? Welcome back to another episode. This is a very special episode. It's the Huxley Morton podcast. How did that name come up, uh, James and Adam? Because uh, you guys are named James and Adam. <laughs> indeed, indeed. I'll let James answer that the one. Huxley, the Huxley Morton podcast is, I guess, look, um, I run a recruitment business. Um, recruiting clinical research professionals into to trials, particularly in the, in the US, but also here in the, in the UK. Um, the podcast came about when the pandemic hit and I was speaking to pharma company owners, industry leaders, sharing their stories of growth, how the challenges that they had faced. And I just thought, I'm getting asked these questions from everyone left, right and centre. I should start you know, verbalizing this on a wider scale, hence the podcast. Um, so it was just quite simply the company name of the podcast. Or are you asking where the, the name Huxley Morton came from? I think that's what he's asking, James. Yeah, because this is a better story. <laughs> yeah, because I think the first time you messaged me, I thought it was spam. I'm going to be honest. I thought it was spam because <laughs> I saw the name and I'm like, well, what is this guy's not even named that? Why would it, if that guy wanted me to interview why wouldn't they reach out directly? This is weird. So then I just stopped until your next one. So thank you for being persistent because you guys have a great story to share. Sure. So look, the, the company name itself um, came about, I, I, my background was in engineering and recruitment, sending, I guess, British expats all around the world to build roads, bridges throughout Asia, Africa, the developing um, countries of this world, I guess. Um, and I got a name for myself because I was the British guy that could provide these West, you know, the Western expertise. Um, And I guess when I left my former company and and decided I was going to start a business, I was like, I want something that sounds traditionally British. So I was kind of like Rolls Royce, Aston Martin, (laughs) James Bond, Huxley Morton, you know, like it. of two old English names, putting them together to create that feel of that British level of quality um and that's how it came about and i think now that i think about it i've always been a massive fan of the film trading places if you oh yeah that. yeah of course classic so, when I, movie. classic, classic classic i think they're classic. redoing it no or they redid coming to america they have, i think they, they were have redoing redone it, it. but oh, okay. when i see huxley and i see morton it's duke and duke that i visualize as the two old english gentlemen who would be Huxley and Morton. So that's kind of where the whole <laughs> image and yeah name came from and was, was dreamt up. That's awesome. So where are you guys based out of? Like, uh, where do you live? So I'm in London, Adam. So I live very close to uh, the sea. So I'm th- that's actually uh, Brighton Beach. This is the, the old West Pier in, oh, okay. on, on the south coast of the UK. Awesome. And I live just the other side of the Downs. So I'm very close to here. This is where I grew up. And awesome. uh, that, that's constantly reminding me of uh, where I came from. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. You know, London, I guess I could ask you, there's a lot of CRA. There's a lot of people. Um, we're going to get into your story, both of you guys. But sure. there's a lot of CRAs that reach out to me from London that all of them are trying to move to either Canada or the U.S. So is there not like a market for CRAs in the U.K.? There is, however, and I've, I've recently done a post on LinkedIn about this, that the U.S. market has just gone crazy. Yes. You know, we, the we, money we, spoke, a, we spoke about it the other day, didn't we, James? Yes. Yeah. Um, and I think that, I guess, to give you a bit of an, an idea, kind of like a clinical a CRA in the U.K. may get 40, 50K in, in pounds sterling. Um Whereas in the US, it's a heck of a lot more. Um, Likewise, clinical project managers kind of in the UK, it might be 70K in in British pounds. Whereas in the States, it can be 150, 160, 170,000 US dollars Mm. for doing the same job where it's remote. Plus, let's let's be honest about it, our weather isn't always amazing over here in London. Well, the US is a big place as well. Um, (laughs) But I think if I can follow on from that, I mean, there are a handful of CROs, and I think I've probably worked for most of them in the UK, and they are 
pockets of them around the UK, and then there are pharma and biotech. Now, once you've once you've been to a few of the CROs, and perhaps you want to jump the fence to to a to to a pharma company, there aren't you know there aren't that many opportunities to be quite frank. And and much of the work that I've mm. done over the years has been actually supporting overseas companies in the U in the US and in in Europe, because. If you look beyond your own boundaries, particularly as we've said, you know, with regards to um, remote working now being the norm, you know, I used for two and a half years, I got on a plane and went to Denmark and worked for Nova Nordisk every week. Um, And I've also commuted to Munich for six months or nine months of of a year. So pre pandemic, there were opportunities overseas if you were flexible and you could jump on a plane and you could do these things. And now, you know, with the advent of, of, of virtual working, you can work anywhere. This is the point. And everyone knows that. So, yeah. you know, if you can overcome the logistics and you can prove to yourself as an individual to that particular hiring company that you're worthwhile, then you can do the job, can't you? Yeah, no, that's... Uh, so I, I always wonder about that. And I, I don't know enough about uh, the ecosystem there. I know AstraZeneca is their icon. Uh, there's, I, I was always thinking there's got to be, if the demand is so big here in the States, why is it not there? But maybe it's for, for reasons you just said, all the work's going to independent consultants or academia. There, there, are, there are opportunities, don't get me wrong. And I think, you know, probably there are many people who are just looking for the opportunity to leave these shores. You know, I would say without getting too political, the UK is not the greatest place to be right now. You know, there are many, many reasons why people are looking overseas, not just for the weather, but certainly because, you know, as a nation, we are an island nation and we're not actually doing ourselves a lot of favours by, you know, shutting down many of the boundaries that we had open borders to to countries before. And that's Mm. the other reality of it, I would say, wouldn't you, James? Yeah, I think so. It's, I think it's a combination of all of those things. The weather is probably a big one for, for a lot of people. You know, pa- pandemic has made people realise that they're working from home and actually, hey, I could do this gig from, from anywhere. Yeah. So why am I confining myself to these specific borders where we're getting, you know, more restrictions, more aggro with, with the, the, the government? And hey, actually, if I took the better weather and the, the bigger opportunities, I could actually make more money. Um, you know, combine all of those things. It's kind of like put yourself in in someone's shoes like that. What would what would you do? You know, it's but, that's how, I, it, how it is. I think the other thing is possibly the the people that you might be being approached by Dan would be of a younger generation. Dare I say it? Who are less restricted? Who have more flexibility? Who could jump on a plane and take their lives in a <clears> in a in a suitcase with them? And, that's true. You know, yeah. I, I I recruit and interview plenty of those people as well. And they're very highly skilled. They're very talented. The kids coming out of university these days are absolutely top draw because you don't go to university anymore in the UK for an easy ride because you're going to be looking at 50,000 sterling of debt when you finish. You know, that's that's yeah. a student loan that you're going to be looking at. So the only kids that are going in and coming out of university are really high achievers these days. Wow. All right. Okay. That's, uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, let's talk about how you guys get started in clinical research. And then there's so much to talk about because you guys have a podcast you do together, but you guys are independent of one another. You have your own things going on at the same time. You both have your own story. And then the podcast kind of making your stories converge, but you're still maintaining like separate career trajectories as well. Can you kind of like give us a breakdown how you got started in research how you discovered it and what you're doing now. Do you want me to answer that one first? I'll tell you what, Adam, what about if I, oh. uh, I'll lead in because that's how we, we then met, isn't it? I, I guess. Um, Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Look, as, as I mentioned, I had previously been recruiting into engineering and construction, like senior level guys. I think my whole network was full of predominantly males in their 60s, maybe so, some of them 70s who would jet off to Afghanistan, the Philippines, no, no matter where it was around the world, they would go almost at a drop of a hat. However, when the pandemic came in, a business that relied on international flights and travel, etc., it just fell off the cliff. Um, and kind of like you, having heard your story, I did not want to be laying off staff, making cutbacks, um, and just, you know, crawling up into a shell and, and saying, this isn't for me, I'm going to go back and, and get a, a regular job. Um, so we um, we adapted. One of our, our guys had 
recruited into pharmaceuticals before. He explained how trials are structured quite similar to construction projects. You know, you've got a construction project manager, you've got a clinical project manager. The, 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 the monitor is like the resident engineer. It was kind of just a load of different key words that needed to be swapped and I needed to adapt and I needed to understand um, the, you know, the differentials, hence why I've tuned into your channel to find out all the basics. Um, we, you know, we dove, uh, yeah, dived in two feet first and just started speaking to as many people as we could because, you know, we knew that we could find the best people in the world to go wherever in the world. We could certainly find people in clinical research to stay in the States or in the UK to do work in clinical research. We just had to build a network. So that's all we did for like six months is just speaking to, to and, and networking. Uh, and through that, we picked up a few clients, not as many as I'd like, uh, but in speaking to them, um, I was hearing their stories and they said, look, we've, we've not heard of you. How did this come about? So I explained this story and they said, oh, wow, that's, you know, really impressive. I, you know, <laughs> would, wouldn't have known, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they were impressed with the speed of our service. And I was just like, oh, and how did you, you know, just out of interest, how did you start in clinical research? They would tell me their story. And I thought, this is a good idea for a podcast. I could start sharing this it'll kill two birds. I'm, I'm dealing with clients. I'm learning myself. And one of the first people that I reached out to was Adam via LinkedIn. Um, I'd seen something that he had posted. And I just said, look, you look like you're an industry expert. I'd love to start a podcast. This is my plan. I haven't even started yet, but do you fancy jumping on a Zoom call um, to talk through the format and, and perhaps kick, kick it off and be one of my first guests? <laughs> he agreed. And here we are. Just the bagging it. History. Just the bagging rest, it. The What's the word? History. Blagging. Oh, okay. just blagging. <laughs> just <laughs> blagging it. Uh, I see. So, how but did like, you get I, in? I Adam? guess it didn't necessarily feel like that because I, I guess <laughs> I, I always, you know, I, I'd, I'd worked at a huge company, like a thousand staff previously. I was the, the top performing recruiter there, so I felt confident in my recruitment ability. I just didn't know research. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Adam. Adam then kind of took over adam I'll, I'll let you share your story my man so so how i got into this industry uh, not dissimilar to your background story actually you know i was a failed medic i didn't get the grades to do medicine i always wanted to do medicine and i did what i thought was the next best thing and i studied pharmaceutical sciences and i went to a wonderful university which was a four-year placement and in that third year of industrial placement i actually figured out what i really wanted to do and that was really working clinical research. It wasn't to be wearing the lab coat that I was wearing that year. Uh, I had a wonderful time at university, but I really, really focused and understood where I wanted my attention to be. And that was really to be around as much medical information as I could. That was the thing that just got me out of bed in the morning. I was fascinated and I'm still fascinated by medicine, technology, the pivot around medicine and technology. And it's just grown and grown and grown. So, you know, my first job, 25 years ago, believe it or not, was in clinical research with a company that was bought out by Quintiles. And since then, I've worked for big CROs, so Quintiles, which is now IQVIA, Covance, <laughs> which is now LabCorp, Cineos Health, which was called I3. Those were the big CROs I worked for. You're as old well school as, if you know Quintiles and I'm not IQVIA. I'm proper old school. <laughs> I'm proper old school. Um, and, and I've I was given an opportunity to set up an early phase biometrics unit from scratch at a company called Richmond Pharmacology in, in London. And that was where, where I really cut my teeth about 15 years ago. And so it was literally write the SOPs, build the team, figure out the processes, work alongside the PI, make it happen, oversee the outsourcing, bring it in-house, do everything, literally nuts and bolts from ground up to you know, winning the business developing the protocol, working alongside the PI, being that final pair of eyes with the TFLs that go into the clinical study report and oversee every little step of the way. So I learned it from the ground up there and took that to another level then um, in other companies. I did a similar thing at another CRO in the UK in Manchester, and I've been independently consulting for about six or seven years supporting CRO, med tech, uh, medical communications, rare disease companies, and then, you know, the, the podcast came about, as James said, you know, he approached me. I, I've always been quite visible on LinkedIn, to be quite frank, because I've found that there's been quite a lot of traction for me over the last few years. And I would say in the last two years, more than ever, 
but I have a very strong professional network. So I work with a lot of people in the industry. It's not a huge industry, as we know, and people remember good, good work. And so they often come back and say, well, I remember you did this installation or this setup. And do you, do you, do you still do that? And can you do this? And I've got this problem. Can you fix it? Oh, yeah. I, need, I need a fresh pair of eyes. Can you just put some, put some meat on the bones or something? And, and that's how many of my conversations and business development comes about these days. Um, and, I, and I have a portfolio of, of clients now, which I never had before. I only have had one. And and this last two years, it's just been mushrooming, as 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 we've discussed. You know, it's been an incredible time for really responding to opportunity. Because you know, with 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 all with all um, honesty, it's we're living through the biggest clinical trial that ever happened, and yeah. there's never been a better time to be working in this industry and be passionate about what I, what I do, what we do, and what we're involved in. I absolutely love the work that I do, and I love having the opportunity to meet and, and diversify into all sorts of different avenues. So taking on from James's point, you know, that's, that's where I find myself. And I, I just, just love what I do to be quite frank. Yeah, no, that's amazing. I'm looking at your LinkedIn now and I see the biometric consultant and all the posts you're putting the podcast. I mean, this, I think this is awesome what you guys are doing. What, what is the, I guess, what is the short term goal of, for the podcast? And what is the long-term goal for the for the podcast, <laughs> James? You can answer that one, and then I'll I'll I'll, I'll come along your t- c- t- coattails because I've had some thoughts about that as well. Funny enough, short short-term goal. You know what, Dan? I've, I've never really thought of it. Mm. Like initially, it was kind of like, "Hey, I should do this." I then I started doing it, and I was just like, I, "I'm going to keep doing this." Um. And I've never actually sat back to think, what is the goal of the podcast? I, it certainly wasn't, I've never set out to be a YouTuber or to monetize the podcast. And uh, I've been quite open with Adam, you know, on, on that factor. The short-term goal is, is put out a good episode, hope that people like it. And that's pretty much it. Long-term yeah. goal, I, I think it it does me no harm. You know, I, I end up picking up um, business off the back of it. It doubles up it's it's business development for me it's marketing for me it puts me out there it's also teaching for me you know i'm embedding myself in in an industry that let's face it a year in that's nothing really an industry um but i think the fact that we're we're new as a um as a recruitment business in the life science space and innovative and doing different things and and you know approaching um talent acquisition in a way that not many other people are actually sets us apart. Um, and I think, you know, I, I lost out on a proposal recently because um, a client said we didn't have 15, 20 years experience recruiting into life sciences. I was like, hey, 100%, I, I agree with you. And that's, if anything, that's my selling point is because, you know, <laughs> we're, we're you know, that's what, you, if you are looking exactly. for that, that is, not, that is not me. You know, I'm yeah. the polar opposite for that. You know, I'm sending video notes voice notes doing all sorts of, of like stuff that people haven't necessarily done before and i you know i get a lot of responses back saying hey this is the first time i've had one of this these i don't normally speak to recruiters or you know just so, so many you're things. sending so you're sending a video let's say so who are you primarily recruiting like what what role are you uh cras C, uh, ctas um ctm cpms and, and this is worldwide in, worldwide in, all, all in the clinical vertical but purely in the us and the uk that's okay that's us and moment. uk yeah i mean but there's there's only there's there's 10 of us at the moment um and again i'm, I'm wow. big on having a focus and being kind of inch wide mile deep like i want to be the best in that one thing rather than doing loads of things if people approach me about you know regulatory folks or you know something else i'm kind of i'm open i just say we we don't do it i don't want to waste your time i see come back to me you know i'll I'll come back to you probably when when we do (laughs) yeah and like a year or so i want to come back to you because i think there's a lot of value and advice you can give to people who are looking to transition careers or even just enter the industry um but Adam, you know, what about you? And Same. I think Dan, a lot oh, of the no. advice that you put out is 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 sound advice. Like entry yeah. level folks 
they don't always necessarily need a recruiter. Like I know it right. sounds counterproductive to me as a business, but a lot of the entry level folks, my clients don't necessarily want to pay a recruiter to get exactly. someone that they could they could pick up. So you need to be uh, visible on LinkedIn. And a lot of the advice that you give is solid advice. And I don't mind sharing that with people because, you know, I don't want to charge clients for something that they could do themselves. When you know who's going to reach out to you? We're going to have people right now, guys. Look at James, right? You CRAs that are disgruntled with your jobs. Reach out to James. I tell people right now, there is zero <laughs> reason, zero reason, zero why you should be unhappy in your current with your current employer. Take you control. can move, move. James, if somebody has two years of monitoring experience, is that enough for you to like work with them, put them somewhere else? Yeah, 100%. So, as long as you've got a couple of years, no problem. Um, I mean, if I can follow on from, from what James is saying, you know, it, this conversation reminds me of years ago, but but in, in the respect of, you know, sometimes you don't realize where you're at until you reflect on it. And, you know, we've had an incredible year. We've, we've interviewed some fascinating people. And the point is that we're both coming to this from very different positions. I've recruited a lot into this industry and I've built high functioning teams and managed global teams. So I know what it takes to get the job done. And James knows what it does, what, what it takes to get those people into the positions to fulfill those roles. and you know, ka-ching. But, but the point is, you know, we're, we're coming at this from very, very different standpoints. And this is where the podcast really grew out of, I would say, is, is really that, that we're coming at this from such different perspectives and yet complementary. Yes. In such a complementary fashion because, as I've said to you, there are some incredible people coming out of university, but there are also some highly talented people with several years of experience that can pivot and go to other companies and do a great job very quickly and hit the ground running. And you want, we want those people, you know, we really do want the best. We want to attract the best, but also, you know, from an employer's point of view, James gets good, good candidates. And, and I see these CVs all the time, not just from him, but, you know, I get approached all the time from, from people who are interested in getting into the industry, whether it's from my old university or various other places. The fact is, there's never been a better time to be in clinical research. As you say, you know, if you're not happy, you've got no reason to, to sit on your hands and do nothing about it because there has never been a, a, a better time to be involved in this industry. And people are so highly sought after, good people. And it's not about jumping ship just because you don't fancy it. We're talking about there are huge incentives out there for moving around and finding a position that actually fits your skill set the best it possibly can. And I think, as I said to you already, Dan, you know, many of the activities that I find myself involved in, you, you don't necessarily have them on your CV. It's just sometimes someone will just contact me on LinkedIn or send me a message and just say, you know, I've seen some content you put out there. I've got this problem. Can you help me with it? Can you, you know, can we have a chat? Or we've had a podcast with, with someone and they've said, you know, we had a great chat and I really connected with you. I'd really like to work with you. Have you got some time where we can just have a chat? And and because of the you know the value of this medium, this is happening literally all the time now. How um, Adam? How did uh, you? Well, I guess you were James's first guest, right? Or or one of the first. I think guests. I was number two, wasn't number I? Number two, definitely in. I think he, he may have been the first person I spoke to. The, the order that I, it would, now, I was number two. I run the, the business with my, my partner Lucy. <laughs> so who's number she, one? Number one didn't want to do it. James, so number two said yes. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> He's getting embarrassed. I was, I was, I'm just I was, I was still too busy <laughs> getting blown out by you at the time, Dan. I was still uh, chasing, chasing <laughs> your number, wasn't I? Man, that's <laughs> something else. So but, Adam. But, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. What were you going to no, say? No, I was going to say, I absolutely adore podcasts anyway, whether it's visual or audio. I have two dogs now. Sadly, I lost a dog recently. Uh, I've also got two Sorry. kids, but they don't like walking with me as much. Um, so I have some <laughs> of the best. <laughs> I do some of my best learning when I'm walking with my dogs and I listen to podcasts. And there's a couple that I really, really love. And they're personal improvement. They're professional. Um, they're all manner of different things, but actually I, I love learning from other people. And if you don't learn from other people, then you're very fixed in your mindset. Mm -hmm. And I've always appreciated learning 
and there's never been a better time to learn from other people almost you know in in the back of your mind when you're not even trying you know when you're walking and talking and breathing the air in there is never a better time neurologically for it to go in and embed and that's when I find I do my best thinking when I'm walking my dogs when I'm listening to a pod and when I'm just enjoying the view um so so to have the opportunity to be on a pod as, as James inter- interviewed me was great but also as a kid there was a friend and I we had a pirate radio station many many years ago and we used to have these Im- imaginary conversations believe it or not I've not told you this James but no. when I was when I was 12 me and my mate we had this with this this pirate radio station and we used to just play music and talk like this really <laughs> maybe not about clinical research but we would pretend we were older and we were living a different life and that was kind of how it was so you know the opportunity to really um put yourself out there i'm i'm very very happy with putting myself out there i don't you know i'm i'm, I'm very risk of I, i'm i'm not i don't have a problem with with taking taking risks and pushing myself out of my comfort zone because life you know life is too short and i've had some you know I've had some real curveballs in my life and and I now am at the at the point in my life where I'm I'm happy to take those chances because you know I'm I'm fortunate enough to have a strong family behind me and you know some very strong mechanisms and structures behind me that give me that confidence as much as anything. So for you, I mean somebody who came from like I3 research and you know traditional like covans i see on your linkedin here to now freelancing and doing like apparently super cool things with biometrics what what are you what is your short and long-term goal for the podcast like personally well i mean i think i think my short-term goal is really just to get to get my content get some content out there to talk about things that people are interested in um there aren't that many people who are doing this at the moment. And, and I think James picked up on that point. But also, because it's such a small industry, it, it's worth opening, opening that Pandora, Pandora's box and, and, and giving people that opportunity to hear content. I think there's some very interesting conversations that we have all the time. We never know where they're going to go. And, and as far as long-term goal, I don't know. I mean, it seems to be a great business development tool. It puts our content out there. My parents love watching it, so I know they're going to be watching this one. I always send them the links, and they love watching it on YouTube. So, you know, my dad often says to me, you know, how proud he is that that I'm doing something of, of value to an industry that he thinks is, um, you know, in an amazing place. And he's someone who's personally benefited from a lot of medicine over the last few years. He had a, he had a stroke 13 years ago, and he didn't leave the house. My mum is his primary carer. He didn't leave the house for over a year because he's so, you know, vulnerable. And I wouldn't let him leave the house, to be honest, until he had the vaccine in his arm, two jabs Mm -hmm. of the vaccine. And so their lives have been directly impacted over the last 15, 20 years by by medicine, by the wonders of what we're involved in. And that gives me the greatest pleasure than 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 I can ever describe. And and, and as for my kids, they think I'm an influencer in this area. So that's what they think. Now, if they if they're saying that, that's great. But I, I'm not sure about that. You guys are. Watch, I think watch out Joe Rogan, right, Adam? Does he need to be worried? <laughs> I don't know. Your body of your guy's body of work speaks for itself. I mean, I glanced at the YouTube channel when when James reached out to me to see who you guys were, and I'm like, oh wow, you know they've not only said they're going to do it, but they've been consistent with it, which is, it's one thing to say, yeah, let's do a podcast. Another thing to actually do it, you know, day in, day out, week in, episode by episode, to crank them out. Adam, yeah. I'm yeah. going to ask Adam first, and then I'm going to go to James with okay. another question. But Adam, where do you see the industry going forward in the next decade? So walk us through opportunities yeah in this industry and then maybe talk about biometrics too because maybe the audience knows very little about this okay so well what we've seen in the last two years has been nothing short of transformation in 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 action so i'd never worked on a clinical trial on a drug that had got to market in less than 10 years never yeah and and i worked on the first viagra study for pfizer okay, ah, when i was working yeah. at coban so I, i've seen things go well <laughs> <laughs> were you on the heart uh, lowering blood pressure arm or the actual erectile dysfunction part erectile dysfunction i yes. see 
Okay. Fascinating. Really. No, no problem. No problem enrolling patients for that. No. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the interesting thing. Okay. So, so that was, you know, that was what I thought at the time was game changing. Okay. Cause everyone was wanting the blue pills. But what was interesting was then the follow on one of the follow on studies that I then got involved with was was a female erectile dysfunction um, study for Pfizer where they, you know, logistically tried to see whether it would have a similar effect on the, on the female um, erectile uh, <laughs> yeah. organs. A libido, and, and, it a libido. <laughs> and it didn't. Yeah, it didn't. It, it simply didn't. So you know, you 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 know, you see these bell-shaped curves when it comes to um, successes in, in medications. And as I said to you, you know, I've been very fortunate over the last couple of years to be working on, on, on COVID vaccines. And it has never been more extraordinary to be involved and to see it at the coalface, genuinely at the coalface, life-changing medicines happening. And, and that was why I came into this industry in the first place. So it, in answer to your question, where do I see it in the ten, next 10 years? Funnily enough, I was listening and walking walking and listening to a podcast this morning, talking about the psychology of epidemics and pandemics. And what they were saying and what, what it was suggesting was actually that there is, there is a, an inertia to, to pandemics. People, people don't want to accept them. You know, a lot of people shut down and say, I don't want to be affected by that. You know, they don't want to be told what the rules are. They don't want their lives to change. They just want to carry on doing what they're doing. Well, if ever we've known that that's not the case is now, right? So we've had all of our civil liberties taken away and they're gradually, they're coming back and they're coming back and life seems to be resuming some sense of normal. And yet, certainly talking about the UK figures, you know, we've got tens of thousands of infections every day. My daughter right now has COVID. You know, she's at home. She's very poorly right now. I've seen it firsthand how, and she's got two jabs, I should say as well. So wow. she's an 18 year old, nearly 19 year old girl. She's been very sick for a week and I've seen it firsthand and I am very careful and cautious about, well, she's behind a locked door at the moment, to be honest. You know, we're literally feeding her, her food through, <laughs> through, through the door and then shutting the door. Is the O2 good or uh, she's just feeling like flu like symptoms or is like her oxygen lower? No, her oxygen seems to be fine. I mean, okay. I'm, I'm, she seems to be getting out the other side, but it's day eight now. Okay. And, and I mean, she's really been knocked sideways. So, wow. You know, the, the fact of the matter is, you know, for all that people don't like to be told what to do, there are reasons why we have to behave in a certain way when there is a pandemic. And we know a lot more than we do today than we did when Spanish flu hit in 1918, for example. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, you know, we know about germ theory. We know an awful lot about social distancing. We've learned about very many other pandemics and, and epidemics that have happened in in our lifetime and we should have done better we should have been better prepared for this and that's if i have any frustration it's the fact that governments and big pharma have known about this for a long time and have done nothing and yet in the last two years ago no one was working together now everyone's working together academics pharma companies r d you name it they're all doing it and mm. they're all coining it coining you know making big bucks but the fact of the matter is we're probably going to have to live with this for at least the next three to five years. You know, whether or not you choose to go into public places with a face mask on or whatever should be as about as, as much about you preventing transmission as it is from, you know, receiving whatever viruses right. or other bugs are out there. So I think culturally we will change in that respect globally. And I haven't been on a plane for two years. I haven't left this country for two years. Oh. So, you know, people in the UK are, well, I don't know, we're, we're quite a rule and law abiding nation, I would say. So we do as we're told, I would say a, a large proportion of the population do. And, and actually, when you do that, you realize and appreciate what's important. Now, what's always been important to me is my family. So I've got two kids and a wife, and I love them very much. I also have two parents who live very close by who are not getting any younger. And I love them very much. And I'm very careful about how I look after them as well. So you know, what, what we recognize now is that what, what have we got? We've got family, we've got friends, and we've got our lives. And, you know, I'm very happy to have a life right now that we didn't have in the middle of that lockdown when you couldn't see anyone, you couldn't do anything. So let's, let's just accept that for the next few years, we're going to be living this, this life. And there might be, you know, little, little um, sparks of hope that come along. But actually, in reality, I think pharma companies 
are changing their models. They are using technology to their to their absolute benefit right now. I mean, we, we've touched on decentralized trials. It's not just a buzzword. The fact of the matter is, is that aside of putting medications into, into arms and, you know, devices and various other things, as much as you can do remotely, I think people will be doing that more and more because no one wants to waste half a day going to a clinical research center in London if they can do most of that inclusion exclusion criteria over the phone right if they can report their adverse events on an epro device on their phone similarly um and then let's say maybe once every three months you have to go in and and get your bloods taken or you know something something like that so i think i think in reality logistics will change around clinical research but also i see technology being pivotal and that's really the thing that has driven a lot of the interest that people are approaching me about is the technology, it's the so what, it's the how do we get these things to work better? You know, how are we going to learn from the information using artificial intelligence, machine learning, being smarter with the data that we have, looking at big data sets, real world evidence, and pooling that information outside of generic clinical trials and, you know, very, very, um, methodical clinical trials into a, a more broad real world setting that's how i see this this spinning out in a roundabout way i hope i've answered that in a in a, in a way yeah and you've uh, stimulated another question so i'm of the mindset i'm not anti-tech at all hmm. i i don't think technology by itself is the answer to all the industry's problems as a lot of the thought leaders would like you to think so are you like, do you think that because technology is a deflationary force at the end of the day, it's meant to make things more efficient mm -hmm. because of that, theoretically, you don't need as many people working on it. Yep. Yep. Do you think that is going to impact uh, careers or do you think the two are going to work together and kind of offset? one another because the industry is growing so quickly technology is not enough no 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 here's the thing i think you need people to do work that's the point you need bums on seats we always need bums on seats but we need highly qualified experienced people to do the jobs that perhaps in the past may have been what we would think were you know fairly automatic type roles you still need people to do those things you still need people to physically um you know, perform those activities on a face-to-face -face basis. But the, the point of the matter is, is that what I see is there are more specialist expert roles to advise on a consultancy basis. And that's that's been the, the bulk of the work that I've been doing for the last few years has been on that advisory level where, you know, you've seen the nuts and bolts of clinical research from the ground up. And it's the, how do we really scale this or what are the principles that actually everyone needs to know to take this forward if i'm building a business from the scratch what are the minimum requirements that i need you know what's my minimum viable product for a technology for a system for a software for a clinical trial site you know what what what's the very minimum i could do out of the trunk of my car what do i need to get started do you know what i mean because that's effectively what people are asking me you know yeah. How quickly can I get this done? Because because I got investors and I got people and I got people lined up around the corner that want to want to sign up to my clinical trials. So it's really about doing it smarter, faster, quicker, and as efficiently as possible. I think with using technology and people together is what. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. You you've got to have the right people though, and I think you you know you made that point in a previous conversation that we had about having the right people. I don't want automatons. I want people that can think. Same as you. You know, I automatons are coming anyway, so you don't need them in human form. Exactly. So you need people who can who can think for themselves, who can challenge the status quo, who are not fixed in that little box, and and really get it, but get it because they've done the doing and they understand it and they peel back the layers and they figured it out and they understand it. Uh, yeah, I had someone the other day asking me, "Hey, I'm a P. I have a PhD." uh in molecular biology am i qualified to be in research and i'm like oh, are you kidding me what <laughs> what this is what you're supposed to do what do you mean and they're like well i've never worked in clinical research well you need to you like you go do it just, just go do it yeah exactly go do I it mean, it's i i can honestly say i 
without word of a lie, you know, most of the people I work with have far more qualifications than I do, and yet they don't have common sense. And it's mm. common sense that will get you and differentiate from others. It's it's the yep. doing. It's yep. the it's the so what. It's the what's the solution? It's coming up with the solutions. It's applying that actual knowledge, the doing to a real life situation. Mm. Do what others refuse to do. That's going to be my Instagram quote. James, we got to come back to you. You said you started off the podcast with an amazing analogy. You said clinical research. I can't stop thinking about it. Clinical research is just like construction. You know, you get the parts, you get the project manager. I'm thinking about that. And I'm like, you're absolutely right. I mean, the patients, I think, would be the brick right? The bricks, like brick by brick. That's how you get the house. That's how you get the study is the patients. Um, what do you think about, because this is related to technology, the new construction companies that are coming through pre-built houses and just putting them on, you know, as what's the analogy for clinical research there? Is that decentralized trials? And then can you, I guess, just kind of talk about this analogy a little bit better? Because I want to hear more about this. I don't think I'm necessarily qualified to talk about whether decentralized trials are, are kind of like putting the, the prefab on there because, as I say, I'm, I'm always very open to say, look, I'm not a clinical researcher. My game is recruitment, and I kind of try to boil it down to the simplest level because that's how I think that most things should be in life. It well, we'll leave that part for Adam for the pre-built house, but let's just – can you unpack the, so the to, analogy? To, to unpack a little bit more on – my former recruitment life to how it relates to, to clinical trials. So I would work with big engineering uh, consultancies, the likes of maybe Acom, WSP, um, Lewis Berger that people may have heard of in the States. Um, they would tender for work with effectively sponsors who would be the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the Millennium Challenge Corporation in, in the States who would fund projects, projects are trials. <laughs> um, they, will, they will put forward a team of potential experts that are going to run that trial, just like a CRO do. So the engineering consultancies were effectively CROs. They would staff projects, manage the projects, the sponsor would put up the money. Um, and I would be the middleman to provide the top qualified individuals to go and manage those projects. So if anything, in the engineering world, all of the, my network were 25 plus years of experience, master's degrees. They had to have worked 10, 15 plus years overseas, you know, have a Superman badge and all sorts of just crazy criteria that you just wouldn't even dream of. So yeah. when I heard how clinical research works and kind of started putting these pieces together, I was like, okay, construction project manager, it's a clinical project manager. They're going to run, you know, <laughs> the, the data management or in the world of highways, it'd be like, okay, they'll manage the materials guys. They'll manage it's the brilliant, design, man. This design, is brilliant. Guys. And I my, think that's you need... how my mind literally broke it down into just compartments of this is what I've been doing. This is what I'm looking to do. Here's the comparison. And it's almost identical. If I can just switch my mind to that, I was, I would consider probably one of the top recruiters in the world for the engineering side of things. I was like, wow. I just need to take that expertise, flip it into research. And I think from the feedback that I've started to get from some clients, it's going well. I mean, wow. I, I got some feedback from a client the other day. I honestly thought that the level of speed and service compared to what I was used to providing for some of my clients was fairly shocking really and they came back to me and said hey we want to offer you some more more business more exclusivity more retained work more contracts because you have by far been the best person that we would work for and i was kind of like <laughs> wow how has this come about but i but guess because i don't know what i don't know and i don't know what the competition is like but it's it's clearly I yeah, that's know. your I, benefit. No, that's, that's your benefit. That's my benefit. Because, my yeah. ignorance is 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 it, paying off. He's, he's got he's got no he's got no baggage. That's the point, yeah. isn't it? You've got yeah. you've got no baggage. You've got no expectation. It's just 
Here's a problem. I do, what I do what I do. That's that's it. I'm very I'm a very simple man, really, Dan. Like I, if you give me an instruction and I'm like, okay, can I do this? This is how I do it. Here's how I'm going to advise on it. I'll be very upfront, talk straight, and then I will deliver on what I say I'm going to deliver. If I can't do it, I'll tell you upfront. But look, you know, outsiders, outsiders bring so much value. I think sometimes people are intimidated because oh, I don't know anything about research. So they're like afraid to come in. And one of our best clients, we, we have a consulting company for people that have sites or want to start sites. One mm-hmm. of our best clients has been with us for over a year, came from a logistics business, like outside of research, completely outside of research. I made good, great money there. So, you know, he's a go getter, entrepreneur, everything. Perfect DNA for doing your site owner. Came in, knew nothing. Okay. In a year, with our help, biz dev, doing their budgets, mm. making seven figures in his first year. At the same token, I have another client, many clients actually, like this, former CRAs for 20 years. They know everything about monitoring so they think they know everything about owning a site who do you think is more successful doesn't mean the cra can't be but because they're coming with a rigid everything's made for them as a cra you cannot go outside of the box your job is to be in the box as a site owner you're all you you have to live outside the box and you know what there was a, a brilliant quote we got it from one of our guests a few weeks back um it was from Einstein. I don't know. I, I can't tell it word for word, but it was something along the lines of you can't solve a problem from the same mindset that created it. <laughs> and it's kind of like me coming into this world. That's why I said when I lost some business recently, you know, that's because I didn't have 15 years as a business in life sciences. I said, exactly. And that is that is not me, you know. We're, we're new, we're innovative, we do things differently, we're quite disruptive. Um, you know, it goes back to when <laughs> you were talking about getting your videographer in. Sometimes we do things, you know, like Arnold Schwarzenegger was said, we, we don't break the law, but often we may bend a few rules in order to, to get to top <laughs> level candidates. Um, you know, sometimes we get a bit of a bite back on that. But hey, yep. in order to get different results, you need to do different things. And that's one thing that I've just never been afraid of, of doing. Um, I think that's my, my sporting background. I, I used to be on the GB team for, for boxing. Like, if you give me something to do, I want to win and I'm happy to almost go and fight for it. James, show him your guns. Show him your guns. He's got oh, big dear. guns. Go. So you don't want to mess with James. Oh, you don't want to mess with James. So that's he's not the, the tallest guy, but he's got is some that seriously... The, James, that's the account receivables department. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. <laughs> this guy, this guy, is, he, he's, he's, he's got some, some muscle. Yeah, he's you got, got some, some Tyson muscle. Fury, Tyson Fury type of guns The, the, the there. boxing days are gone, but yeah, I still like to, <laughs> to go to the gym. I'm kind of, yeah, up and, and in, in the gym at, at five. So he, This guy wow. is a go-getter. Let me tell you, Dan, <clears> this guy is a go-getter. And we've only met each other once in person, okay? This is the other extraordinary thing. And... We met each other and our partners, our other halves, met um, some months ago locally. And and what's really interesting about James, and he won't say this, but I'll say it on his behalf. You know, I deal with a lot of life science recruitment people. I deal with a lot of people in recruitment. And I don't spend a lot of time with people in recruitment, but I seem to spend an awful lot of time with this young man. Yes. And there's a reason for that. No, but there is a reason for that. Okay. The reason being, he has a drive and an energy and an enthusiasm for this business that I've never seen anywhere else, honestly. And I've worked in CROs that have had recruitment, life science recruitment arms alongside. So I've seen and sat alongside the people doing the phone calling every single day. I hear the conversations that have happened and they've tried to recruit me back since. But I tell you what, he's got something in his DNA that's different to the others. And, mm. and that's what, that's, that will be his absolute route to success because he's different. We are different. You know, there is something going on that's magic and it's where it, you can't quite put. I can't put my finger on it, but I know that something great will come from this, whether or not from this conversation. But certainly, you know, the association with James and, and Lucy—they're doing amazing stuff. And I just said, just just get me on that pod. I'll be fine. You just give me the invitations, and I'll be there. You do all the tech. You put all the bits and pieces together, and all of that. 
and I'll just rock up because I knew I wanted to be associated with with him and Lucy, and they're doing incredible. Yeah, this is awesome. I'm I'm actually looking forward to now following both of your guys' career and having you guys on again. And thank you. It's so easy to have these conversations, and we're not even done. But I I wanted like one comment for James. I wanted to make a comment and then Mm -hmm. ask James a question, and then Adam, the comment is gonna come back to you. Um, But so James, two things. Okay, one is a comment. This analogy of the uh construction and re- you got to do an infographic on this that if you pin it on your linkedin is going to help so many people out it's going to because people are lost in the forest they don't see like the whole thing you know they don't they just see the tree the leaf they focus on like the ant on the tree they don't see the forest this will help um but what i wanted to ask you to get my viewers some value here You've been an excellent recruiter in other industry. Now you're coming into research. You've done it enough in research now to get a good feel for the industry. What are some common characteristics, independent of industry, that successful candidates have over non-successful? I would say communication, Dan, and being and being visible. So you, it's basically everything that is not on the CV is often people's biggest selling points. Your CV could be absolutely incredible. And of course, look, that's your shop window that opens the door. But once you are then in front of a client, I think it is your ability to communicate, negotiate to an extent, um, and just be, yeah, simplify things and don't try to sound smarter than you are because you think it's going to please an interviewer. I think that... Often people go in thinking that they're going to get grilled by the interviewer. The reason that you're in it at an interview is because that person interviewing you has seen something they like. They want you to do well. Like yeah. I know for me, I'm I'm hiring at the moment. Every single person that I, I interview, I want them to. I want to hire them. Like they've kind of got the job before I speak to them. The interview yeah. is to, to confirm that. So kind of relax, just be yourself and just communicate what you're what you're all about. That would be my advice to, to any job seekers. I'm curious, can you tell, like I can tell, at least I think I can tell in the first minute I'm talking to a potential site owner, whether they'll be successful or not. Can you tell the same for a candidate? I think so. No, a, a couple of minutes, you you know instantly whether they, they, they have that rapport because they're representing themselves at that time, which is the easiest thing to do because they know themselves, they know their stories. When you're needing them to represent your business, the way they come across to you is exactly how they're going to portray your business. So if you're not happy instantaneously, you know that um, one of your clients is going to probably feel the same because you've got a relationship with them. They've done, people do business with people essentially. Um, So if you've already got that relationship and you feel that someone isn't going to attract that same level of respect or level of rapport with your clients then there's no real point leading them on further in an interview is, is my um advice kind of I, I i interview really quick you know it's, it's normally quick and we normally make a decision on on the first interview and that and that's it very rarely do we even bother with a second interview sometimes because there's my business partner lucy and i will go back just for a second opinion or you know but we often we want them to succeed. The second we pick up the phone and say, hey, we want to get you in for an interview. And I just follow on from that as well. Yeah, because please. I would, I would say exactly the same. I, I would follow on from, from what you're saying, James, with regards to those credentials, that an individual should be an expert in, in themselves. So if they can't answer questions about themselves, then there's a problem. Wow. But but that, <laughs> that's, the, that's the first point. You know, if you're not an expert in yourself, you ain't going to be an expert in anything. And if you can't talk about yourself with mm-hmm. confidence – then again, are you the person that is going to be employed by the individual? <clears throat> and 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 the the biggest thing that I would say that I've learned and got the most traction for me over the last couple of years on LinkedIn has been actually showing the human side. So I am very, very well aware of my human side, okay? I am very happy to talk about things that other people may not be comfortable talking about. We've had some incredible conversations, James and I, with a number of our um, podcasts on mental health. You know, mm. I myself have had challenges with that. Family members have 
for goodness sake, anyone who hasn't got mental health issues in the last couple of years is lying, to be quite frank. So if you can show your human side in in a social sense, you know, on whatever media you choose that to be, people get to know you better. And then when they speak to you, you've already got that instant connection because the amount of times that I, I jump on a on a on a Zoom with people and they go, You're you know, you're really just like I thought you were gonna be. And I, actually I'm really, really I'm really delighted that you're as you know, you're as human and humble as you seem to come across because you've got to marry that up because you can't portray yourself to be something that you're not because there is a complete disconnect and it just doesn't fit, does it, James? I mean, I think that that that's it. You, you've kind of nailed it. It is that being yourself, the amount of people I get the same. It's like, oh, you're exactly how you are on the podcast. I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> it's because it's me on the podcast. We don't do bullshit. <laughs> we just don't. I, and that's my biggest thing. And I, I think there's probably a lot of it in the recruitment game. There is a heck of a lot of, of BS out there. Yeah. And I that's one of the reasons I, I left my old company because I was just fed up with it. You know, I, I was earning a fortune. And, you know, the top performer there, I was just, I hated it. In the end, I was like, no, I don't know what to do, but I'm just not doing this. See you later. And, and, and following on from that, I have also been made redundant in companies where I've absolutely given my all and my, I couldn't have given any more and, and, and been made redundant on the back of that effort and thought, this isn't right. I'm going to take control of this situation. I'm not going to be told that I have or haven't got a job. I'm I'm great at what I do, and I want to be rewarded for being great, not someone else tell me what I'm worth or not, <laughs> and when there is a job or when there isn't. So yes. I'm going to take control, and I've done that, and I've lived it for the last six or seven years, and it's been the happiest I've ever been in my life, without exception. Wow. And I'm going to – so think about this, Adam. Um, the pre-constructed house, all right, yep. where that fits into research. But you guys both interviewed people. So I want to like highlight this part, this little three minute snippet. It's going to be like sh a short. I'm a CRA, two year CRA, okay? You guys interview me. Like just pretend I'm a regular CRA you're interviewing. Group interview. Just act. Okay. people are always asking me. And I'm like, I'm not a recruiter. I don't know. Let's just try two, three minutes. You guys interview me. I'm a CRA looking for a new role as a CRA. Okay. I guess Why should we hire you? What? what why you? Why me? That's a good question. Um, I know what I'm doing. Number one, I'm passionate about the therapeutic indication that you guys are hiring for. I've previously been a study coordinator on the same indication. Um, I'm organized. I know how to go through the protocols quickly. Self-starter. I don't need to be told too often what to do. Okay. I, I know how to do it. So, so it sounds like it sounds like on paper you could do the job, um, right. but we've got five other people who are exactly the same as you and say exactly the same. So, why you? I probably require the least supervision of those five, is what I'm guessing, because I'm self starter, and I'm used to doing things on my own. How have you demonstrated that in your personal life? Can you give me an example of when you've done something like that in your personal life? Oh, they ask you about personal life. This is see Guru Nation. This is good stuff. Uh, let's see. In my personal life, yes. So I've started uh, when I was previously, when I was a site owner, I was in charge not only of getting the work done and getting results, but of managing people on my team and training them on how to do things. So I understand what is already required of me because Perfect. I have done that for others. That's great. That's a fantastic answer. And that's exactly what I want to hear. I want to hear what you've done. With the actions you've taken, how you turned that around, and absolutely what differentiates you from everyone else that stood in the same line with all those same credentials, James. I think a big one, Dan, for as a CRA, uh, you spoke about yourself earlier. Look, it's a stressful gig. You know, talk me through a, a stressful situation that, that you've had and, and how you managed it is probably a good one for, for people to cover. At least have a couple of examples ready mm -hmm. to go. Mm -hmm. um, because everyone wants to know how people will cope in, in that stress, stressful situation, but not, not just theoretically what they've done. That comes into the experience side of things. If you've not been in research, talk about another area where it's been stressful, you've had to meet deadlines, how you did it, and then what you would perhaps do again if given the opportunity, because let's face it, there's always room for improvement. And you've got a, that's probably the other thing that people overlook 
is showing their willingness to actually learn and be teachable because let's face it, managers, um, not necessarily business owners all the time, but managers want to know that they can kind of mould someone in a way that forms, you know, goes with the company culture or the way that they like to do things. Mm. Um, so I'd say that they're, they're, they're all good things. Um, and But for me, sometimes speaking as a recruiter interviewing people, the conversation is often, again, different. I'm When I reach out to people, the people that I reach out to, I'm calling them and targeting them for a reason because I'm already interested. So, yes, I want to know about these stressful situations and how they will deal with them, but I will probably have a conversation like this and say, look, you will get, you, I'll, I'll almost give them some coaching. It's, you know, it's, it's free. It's not, you know, like you get the um, marketing gurus and uh, CV resume experts on, on LinkedIn these days. When you speak <laughs> to me as a recruiter, that is all free. You know, I'm, I'm there to work with people as a collaborative to help them get their foot through the door. I'll then arm them with all the ammunition that they will need to perform well at that interview. But for me, what I want to know about is similar to yourself. Is like, what? Where's their drive? You know, are they sharp? Are they enthusiastic? You know, these these sort of kind of soft skills are the bits that I look for. The personality, the bits that aren't necessarily on the CV. And mm-hmm. and, and and ultimately, you know, if if I'm if I'm hiring someone, what I'm looking for is someone that I actually want to spend eight hours a day with. And if I don't, then there isn't going to be much of a conversation. And I know we shouldn't go on first impressions but the reality is is that we spend a heck of a lot of time at work we spend a hell of of a lot of time not at work thinking about work communicating with people from work so you've got to have that connection and for me I need to make connections with people I'm all about connections and finding the human side because that's the thing that you know if I'm if I'm building a high performing team I want people that are not just enthusiastic and motivated, but actually that I, I'm really interested in. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That I can I can learn from and that are mutually interesting and interested. You know, do they ask questions? Do they want to learn? Do they mm-hmm. want to grow in their capabilities? Mm-hmm. Or do they think they're the finished article? You know, maybe they've got a first class honours from Cambridge and they think they don't need to do anything because mm-hmm. they, they think they've achieved it at 21. Well <laughs> that's one is- of the one of the main things actually Adam that you've touched on there. Like I know, Dan, like the, the idea of, of us throwing loads of questions at you like uh, as a CRA, you know what? The interviewer may or may not be an experienced interviewer. Like mm. I often speak to, you know, people that have been promoted to like director of, of clinical operations, they're interviewing. They, they ask me what questions should they be asking because that's the first time they're hiring. Mm. So probably the, one of the best bits of advice for any entry-level CRAs is to try to take a lead in that interview mm. make it easy to interview you by asking more questions than you're asked that's a great point and and actually at the end of a conversation or during the conversation the questions that you ask as the interviewee often give a greater insight into the brain and the person than anything that you're going to answer because you think you, you know they're fairly formulaic interviews aren't they you know what you're going to be asked and yet it's the it's the other things that you add to the to the conversation that really give a, a much more rounded, interesting um, feedback to the individual. That's what I find as well. You know, those people that really want to engage and understand and you know, what is it that, you know, if someone asks me, what gets you out of bed in the morning? What's a day what's a, a normal day look like to you? Well, my answer is there is no normal day. No two days are the same, you know. We went on a pod with you earlier today thinking that we was going to go one way and you and you quite happily asked us if we join you on, on this discussion. Yes. And we got this we good did. snippet out of and it. And this is magnificent. And this is exactly testament to that point, isn't it? You know, get out of your comfort zone. Do something different. Challenge yourself and see where it goes because you just don't know unless you do that. So I had- yeah, I definitely say that is the one, Dan, that is the one that I'd be driving home to entry level folks is look, you're not necessarily judged on how you answer questions put to you. You are judged on the questions you put to the interviewer. Mm-hmm. I like that. So I had somebody on YouTube actually comment. I'm glad you guys are confirming. They said, Dan, can you put together a cheat sheet for interviews for research? And I said, you can't. There's thousands of things they can ask, variations. 
So, but I didn't go as in depth as you guys did. I just said, you can't do this. So just know the fundamentals and know your context within those fundamentals and try to make yourself appear to be a great person. That's basically the that, advice that's, I give. That's it. I guess the fundamentals, I guess most people should have. Look, it's, it's an important job. You need to have that specific background. Beyond that, it's all, to, for me, I think personality, how you come across, how you conduct yourself, the questions you ask. And you don't necessarily need to. That's where the, the research goes out the side. And that's why I feel comfortable recruiting into clinical research. And I kind of, you know, often say to people that I'm interviewing, I'm like, look, you're the specialist in this but this is what I want to know. And, you know, that's how I, I lead all of my interviews because, but I'm not the clinical research expert, but I am an expert at getting people through the door and selling themselves. I guess, essentially, you know, my background's always been sales. So, you know, I, I would walk into any interview. I think I've, I've aced every single interview that I've ever had and been offered every single uh, job from every interview that I've ever had. Haven't always taken them, but, it's because I knew how to sell myself to how to close an interview, to ask whether there was any reservations, anything that I hadn't covered, all of these small things so that I could then cover that and then make sure that by the end of it, I'd pretty much know whether I had that job leaving that interview. You shouldn't leave an interview not knowing where you stand. One other, one other point to follow on from that, know your value. Okay. So as an interviewee, know your value. Someone asks you what your salary is right now. Okay, that's fine. But what's your value? Now, if Can't you don't know your... states. Yeah. Do they... Illegal. No, no, no. You can't, no. yeah. But you're, true, right? the states, you're not even allowed to, to ask it. <laughs> but but as an interviewer, I can tell you, hey, this is what I'm making, but I know I can make this. So are you in the ballpark? Mm-hmm. Yes. So it's knowing your value to the industry that you serve. And it's taken me years to figure that one out. And I've done costings. And costed for both CRO and farmer. I've been both sides of that fence. So I know the nuts and bolts and I know the numbers. But actually know your value. Know your value to the industry that you serve. Whether that be salary, pension, healthcare, holiday pay, all of those things, sick pay, death in service. Know your value. Know what you're going into the quest. Know what know what you're going into the discussion and what you want to get out of it. I think that's mm. really, really key, particularly for permanent positions. You know, it's, it's very different as an independent consultant. You know, I, 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 think, I think I've pretty much figured that bit out. But actually, from a permanent salary, if you're going to commit, commit, but be sure that you're going to get what you're, you're going to be happy with for the next three, five, ten years, whatever you're committing to. And to add to that, I would certainly say before you commit, depending on when the interviewer perhaps asks about expectations in the interview don't just answer qualify first how you know ask them how could i tell you what what i would be expected when i i don't know how many hours i would be doing what benefits there are all of the surrounding bit because the salary is just one tiny one number it's one one it's fifth of that kind of qualify really. everything you know if we go to buy a new a new house a new car you know someone asks you how much you want to spend on a house how do i know <laughs> How do I know unless I know what's in that house? How many how many square foot it is? Like, has it got a pole? Has it got a hot tub like you guys? You know, <laughs> has it got all of these things? Then I can tell you what I think it's it's worth. I has can't it got answer a garden any office, those questions James? without got, knowing all of the facts. Has it got a garden office? Where you can do your podcast from. Ask We're both all the in questions. garden offices, by the way. <laughs> so perfect segue so end snippet here on the career interview great this for the short attention span for those with short attention span this was just for you full video you gotta go see but okay back house we're talking about house i gotta end with this adam yeah pre-constructed house i i'm obsessed with this i don't know why since james brought it up so there- i'm sorry dan sometimes i say things I won't be able to sleep tonight. I'm thinking about this. They're in 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 residential home building. One of the latest innovations is, hey, rather than needing all these people, you know, all these vendors, let's just build it, bring it. How is that? What analogy is that in research? Is that decentralized trail? I can do better than that. So this last two years, do you know what the company, one of the companies who who I spoke to a long time ago at the beginning of the COVID uh, pandemic started doing they were a mobile covid testing company and guess what they did they got a load of these uh containers and they did their 
PCR testing in the back of the containers and they drove them around. So they mm. got mobile ones and they drove them around and they dropped them and they ended up uh, serving the Premier League football, the PGA golf, the W2A tennis. They're doing it all over the UK, now all over Europe, now all over the US because they are mobile and they literally drop it there. They've got the lab scientists there, all, all the uh, reagents. It's done there and there. On the day, PCR testing, turn around, half an hour, boom. you got Premier League football on TV. And you know how much that is valued at. So, you know, the whole that mobile principle, similar to, you know, to James's analogy, that's what you want to do. And in clinical research, it works a treat because you get the people, you get the services, you get the overheads, you get all the logistics and the infrastructure in place, boom. There you go. Hmm. That's gold that's dust. A, that's a great answer. I'm just trying to think where the sites play into this. Or the sites are need to the sites need to be that mobile. Here, here's here's my next point. My next point is we need to make this happen, Dan. <laughs> well, there's plenty of people doing this though. I mean, they're at CNS Summer right now. Well, they're talking about it. They're not talking doing. the talk. They're not doing they're not walking the walk. Nobody's doing it. I see what you're saying. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. All right. Scalability. Well, it's all about scaling. It's scaling. It's it's taking that analogy and scaling it and scaling it, isn't it? We got to do part two, three, four, five. But I want to end. <laughs> you guys inspire me with your the way you end your podcast. I think that's awesome. I just end mine with a bye. Thank you and bye. But this is better. James, what advice do you give your former self right now? To my former self, I would probably say just get on with it. I think I was always quite like that anyway. I'm quite matter of fact. And I would say, do more of the same. I have very few regrets in that sense. I, I often, often don't think, which sometimes got me into trouble. Um, and, you know, I'd almost be tempted to rein that in. But actually, I would continue on that path of just saying, just do it. Don't think. Don't overanalyze. It's a gift and a curse. I'll tell you, I'm the same. <laughs> mm. Adam. What advice you give your former self when you were just getting into research? So I, I've learned, I've learned, I've learned a few things as I've just as, as I've described. You know, the hard way. I, I've learned the hard way. You know, there's there's no shortcut to to experience. Okay, experience is gained in the trenches, and that's the bottom line. So you can be an SME, a uh, you know, subject matter expert, but you've got to have been in the trenches. So don't don't try and portray yourself as being an SME until you've done it, until you can talk the talk. But actually, to my younger self, you know, I, I was always passionate and I always followed my passion, whether that was on a personal level. You know, I was, like James, very heavily into, involved in, in team sports and then individual sports. I, I, I did a number of marathons and various other individual sports later in life. But actually, do it for the right reasons. You know, I, the, the only reason I do what I do is because I love what I do and I am trying to provide a legacy for my dear children and my wonderful wife and make my parents proud. That's all I'm about. You know, I'm very simple. I'm not doing it for, to, you know, for any other reason other than to, to look myself in the mirror every day and be satisfied with the person that looks back at me, that I've done a, a full day's work and that I've given as much as I could do. And I've always given my best. And that's it. As long as I can do that and I can be true to myself, then I can sleep at night. If I can't do that, then... I've failed, mm -hmm. but uh, that, you know, that advice actually I would have given to my younger self, but I realized it as I got older and faced more adversity and more life challenges with, with some experience of life. And, you know, to, to, to be entirely fair to, to James, he's a little bit younger than me. His, his son is a little bit younger than, than my son and daughter. And, and I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to say I've been there and done it, but my goodness me, kids certainly rub off some of the edges that you might have where it comes to ego. I've got no ego, you know, I just get out of bed and I just try and put a roof over my kids' heads. That's it. And put food on the table. And however I do that, that makes me happy is the thing that drives me. I like that. I like that. We got to definitely do more, you know, part two and three. Oh, last one you guys asked, what book are you reading right now? Or do you read? Do we? We both read uh, quite a bit. For me, I, I think at the moment it's often audio books while I'm um, walking. One, the, one of the recent ones that I read was James Clear, Atomic Habits. Um, huh? I, mean, I am a huge creature of, of habit. I, I think 
maybe I'm just boring. Maybe it's the former, you know, boxer in me that was disciplined, getting up early. But yeah, for me, that is that is the book. And I just, yeah, kind of love it. I like that routine, doing the same thing, you know, having goals, hitting them, ticking things off lists. Love it. I love it. Love a tick list. So yeah, like Atomic it. Habits. This is the audio book that I am currently listening to. Can you see that? The I, subtle I, I, art I of not giving a fuck. Yeah, I read there that one. I listened to that one too. It's good. I like that because here's the thing. You can overthink things. You can overcomplicate things. But actually, keep it simple. Keep it sweet and focus. Just yeah. focus on getting shit done. Get shit yeah. done every day. Tick it off. Make a list. Get mm-hmm. shit done. Don't talk about it. Just do it. Don't procrastinate. That is the worst thing. Just get it done. Every day, tick those things off. I know James is a list maker like I am. My wife is an incredible list kind of, maker. Kind of goes hand in hand with my, my advice to my younger self or pretty much what I did yeah. as my younger self and my habits. So it sounds, sounds right up my street, that. Don't, don't, honestly, don't overthink anything. This is the point. And, and I love this one because it's so simple. But, me, you know, my favorite podcast, there are two. James knows one. It's called the High Performance Podcast, which I highly recommend you to, which is about business, sports, people in life who've just overcome adversity and how they've done what they've done. And the other one is how to fail. And that's learning from your experiences. And every person that comes on gives their three failures, their three life failures and what they learned from it and what how it defined them. And I love to listen to how other people have learned from their experiences and and re reenacted and come out of that as the phoenix from the flames because i've done that that'd be a hell of a way to start a podcast with i guess give me your three failures right now let's go yeah <laughs> how has it defined you honestly i like it's it incredible. i like it it's incredible and the person who does it is is a wonderful a wonderful author and woman called elizabeth day and she has wow. the voice of an angel so if you you know if if you want to hear a beautiful voice speaking really 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 wonderfully to incredibly interesting people you will learn every single time you listen to that podcast i'm gonna go check those out for sure but uh james and adam thank you so much for coming on the huxley morton podcast we'll have a link underneath to the youtube channel where you can go dive deep go watch it all right go listen there's an episode with me on there somewhere and when you're watching in the future it'll be there it was fun And this was fun as well. We'll definitely do part two, three, four, and five. Uh, And thank you guys so much for coming on. Thanks, Dan. It's been a pleasure. pleasure.